fishing do we want to incentivize? Uh, what are the optimum ways of using the resource? And once we have established both those things, uh, it's time to set up a long-term management plan and uh, try to, uh, to implement what, what the, the, like the, um, the starting principles that you've already established. And uh, a person that has looked into uh, what are the keys to success for long-term management plans is Sarah Crack. Finally, you've been with us a couple of times on the screen already. Uh, you're a marine scientist at the Marine Institute and University College of Cork in Ireland. And you will talk about the necessary conditions for compliance and effectiveness of long-term management plans. Um, and you will present your, yourself a little bit more, I think. So welcome to us, Sarah, and thank you for your patience sitting there. <laughs> I hope you've been able to follow our uh, discussion so far. So please take the floor. Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to make sure, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Now, thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting event. I have found it very interesting so far, so um, I really appreciate it that I can uh, participate like this. And it's the first time for me that I do it in this uh, way, uh, remote, so I'm, I'm very sorry that I cannot be there uh, today in person. But I think uh, the technologies to do this remotely have worked very fine. Um, I actually don't see my slide. I think I would like to see my slide. Yeah, that's my slide. So can you still hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, this was the opening slide. So, uh, yeah, I've been asked to uh, talk to you today about uh, fisheries management and, and the problems we experience and uh, hopefully the way to some solutions. Uh, next slide, please. Now, okay, no, wait, uh, back one, please. Yeah, so... Um, now, of course, uh, we all know that we experience problems in fisheries management because uh, globally um, the fish resources are in a very bad state. Uh, many stocks are being uh, overfished, uh, some stocks are depleted. And despite several decades of fisheries management now, uh, we haven't really been able, on a global uh, view, to reverse those negative trends. Of course, there have been uh, success stories, there have been cases where uh, fisheries management has been successful and depleted stocks have been recovered and are being fished sustainably now. But there, have also, there are also some stubborn cases where, uh, despite fisheries management, the stocks are not uh, recovered and not fished sustainably. Now, next, please. Yeah, this picture is just uh, to show you we are all aware of the general problem that is going on. That is uh, that there's too much fishing activity um, going on to catch to try to catch too few fish. So we really need to um, restrict fishing activity. But we are all in agreement about that. So I'm not going to talk about that further. Next, please. Another subject I'm not going to uh, deal with in in this talk very much is um, the uncertainty in uh, the biological knowledge about the state of the resource. So fisheries management is often based on uh, fisheries advice given by scientists, biologists, and these people try to assess the state of the resource and the biological processes that are going on. And of course, this knowledge, this scientific knowledge is uncertain. And because of this, it may contribute partly to uh, the, the failures of, uh, of fisheries management. But I'm not going to address that in this presentation. Next, please. The factor uh, I would like to talk about that might contribute to the non-achievement of, of some um, fisheries management plans is uh, the human factor, the factor of fisher behavior. And unfortunately, um, fisheries management plans and also the scientists that uh, evaluate these plans are often totally ignoring 
and overlooking the aspect of the fisher behavior. They uh, don't at all look at um, how fishers would naturally respond to uh, management measures. Next, please. Now, uh, I'm not the only one who has detected that this uh, point might partly contribute to the non-achievement of uh, fisheries management plans, because um, I took this diagram uh, from a publication by a colleague uh, that was published last year, and this diagram shows all kinds of factors that contribute to, uh, let's say, the failure of fisheries management. Next, please. The upper half of the circle deals with uncertainty um, about the state of the resource, so that's what I'm not going to talk about. Next, please. But the lower part of the circle uh, talks about the human components. Next, please. And over there, one aspect of it is the unexpected behavior. Now, actually, the fisher behavior uh, is not so much unexpected. It's just that it hasn't been um, uh, taken into account. In design of fisheries management plans. So fishers don't behave unexpected, they behave perfectly rational, they behave as profit maximizers, as people who need to make a living of what they're doing. So in that respect, the behavior is not unexpected, it's just not taken into account. Next please. Now often uh, fishers uh, view the regulations as opposing them rather than uh, supporting their interests. So that means that fishers often feel that these regulations are, are working against them. Now, obviously, when this is the case, fishers would not feel very motivated to uh, comply to the regulations. And with uh, non-compliance to the letter, I mean illegal activities, but there's also non-compliance to the spirit of the regulations. And with this, I mean, that uh, fishers would, within the law, so within the regulations, try to find loopholes in the regulations uh, such that um, they can do things to their own benefits, uh, to, to, to make their, their profits, but which are often then um, opposing the general objectives or aims of the regulation. Now, in the corner of this slide, you see the word, word sustainability. That's to remind ourselves that it's, of course, in everybody's interest, the interest of fishers, of greens, of scientists, and of managers, to exploit the resources in a sustainable way. But sometimes the regulation is phrased in such a way that um, the, the fishers feel they have to do um, something like finding the loopholes. Now, the picture of the carrot here, the carrot is a symbol for the concept of the incentive, and with incentive I do not necessarily mean a monetary incentive. An incentive can be any driver or motivator that makes people behave in a certain way. And apparently, uh, fishers often feel that they try to find loopholes in the, in the regulations. Next slide, please. Now, this problem is not uh, new because already uh, two and a half millennium ago, uh, Solon was confronted with this problem. He was a statesman and lawmaker in, in good old Athens. Next, please. And he saw that, uh, he, he, he felt the challenge of this problem that we're also talking about, how he could keep the greed of his countrymen within bounds by means of laws. And in our case, we are not talking about countrymen's greed, but about fishers' uh, desire to make profits. How can they be kept, uh, how can that be kept within bounds by means of regulations? Next, please. Now, Solon already found that uh, the solution uh, must be uh, such that he would frame his laws, so the regulations, in such a way as to make it to everybody's advantage to follow them to the letter and the spirit. So he already found the key. You should make laws that align the uh, say short-term incentives for, for the people with grand-scale objectives of the regulations, so that it would be natural to, uh, to behave uh, according to the regulation, not only to the letter, but also the spirit. Next, please. 
unfortunately, in current uh, management plans and management regulations and policy, there are very many perverse incentives. And with a perverse incentive, I mean that a regulation actually encourage, encourages um, a behavior that is opposing the, the objective of the regulation. Now, just to give you a few examples, please. There are many uh, regulations which have bycatch limits or catch composition rules uh, as a percentage. So, for example, uh, such a regulation would say, wait, go back, please. Can you go back, please? Such a um, regulation would say, for example, a fisher is allowed to fish in a particular area only if he can keep uh, the catches of, let's say, caught below 5%. Now, obviously, such a rule uh, is, uh, has the intention to reduce fishing mortality on, on, on caught. Now, next, please. Unfortunately, it is very well possible for fishers to achieve that percentage of staying below the 5%, not by reducing their caught catches, but actually by increasing the catches of everything else. And that way you can also stay below the 5%. And this then promotes the use of smaller mesh gears. So this is what I call a perverse incentive. The regulation is meant to reduce fishing mortality on caught. It doesn't do it. You can actually go on fishing as much caught before that rule, and it increases the mortality on all other species, so it has an adverse effect, it promotes the use of smaller gears. Next, please. Now, another example of perverse incentive is that currently we work with landings quota rather than catch quota, so uh, starting is entirely legal, currently no uh, regulations that actually limit uh, the amount of discarding. So, unfortunately, therefore, a lot of discarding of over quota catch in mixed demersal fisheries is taking place. Next, please. I can illustrate to you what that, uh, how, why that is. Next, please. Okay, here you see several fish, haddock, and white thing, and nettles. Next, please. And here you see trawler. Uh, targeting for nephros, but as it falls over the bottom there, it unavoidably catches those other species that are present there as well. Please. So conceptually, we can look at the problem as follows. Imagine uh, species A and species B, each with the... Um, Sarah, excuse me for interrupting you. It seems to be a little uh, a bad line now, so we we will try to uh, reconnect with you. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, just a second. There you are again. Can you hear us? Yeah, hello there. I'm here. Yeah. Okay, good. I think it's better. Yeah. Is it better now? Yeah, it sounds better. Yeah. Yeah. Please so, go. So go ahead. Do you, uh, do you think I should go back a couple of slides? Or no, no. Just... You, you can just continue where you were. It's yeah. fine. Okay. I think it's here. Yeah. Okay. No, wait. Back one. Back one, please. No, no, back. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, shall I continue talking? Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Now, what I wanted to illustrate here is that if you have, for example, um, two, two species, species A and B, each with their respective TAC or, or quota, and um, on the, um, the axis there at the bottom, you see fishing effort. That's the fishing effort required to catch uh, those amounts of species A and B. And what you see here, just as, a, as an example, is that the fishing effort required to catch the quota of species B is more than the fishing effort required to catch the quota of, of species A. Next, please. So what can a fisher do who is confronted with this situation? 
Well, of course, a fisher could stop fishing as soon as the quota for species A has been fished up. Next, please. But then he would forego the catches of species e, uh, B, to which he has a legal entitlement. So he is entitled to go on fishing, next please, to fully catch uh, the quota for species B as well. Next please. But in that case, he will unavoidably catch um, fish of species A, which he's not allowed to land, so they have to be uh, discarded. So this is another uh, very good example of a perverse incentive, because these quota are meant to constrain uh, to restrict the fishing mortality of both species. But because we work with landings quota and these uh, fish of species A are being caught and discarded, this regulation does not constrain fishing mortality on, on species A. And moreover, nobody gets a profit from these fish because they cannot be landed. They are dead, so they will also not lead to profits in, in, the, in the future. So the stock is being overfished and um, this is a, a case where uh, the regulations haven't really looked at um, how fishers respond in real life, in the real world. Because in such a case, with this kind of regulations, it cannot possibly be expected that if fishers stay within the regulations, would actually achieve the objectives of the management plan. Next, please. Now, the previous pictures were just uh, conceptual illustrations in an abstract way, but this picture actually shows the same, but based on real data. I took this graph from an article of a colleague. It's based on data of the demersal, demersal North Sea fisheries. So the colorful uh, vertical bars, upright bars, represent the predicted landings or rather catches of various uh, species. And the thin lines of the same color represent um, the TACs of these species. And uh, under this uh, scenario, which was calculated, uh, it, it is calculated such that if each of the fisheries fleets would go on fishing until their last quota is caught up, so what it is their legal entitlement, then for each of these species, the uh, quota would actually be exceeded, so these fish would have to be discarded. So this is really an actual problem in the North Sea, showing that the, the um, quota do not constrain uh, fishing mortality. Next, please. Now, uh, together with uh, some colleagues, uh, I have proposed uh, something that I hope might be a solution to, to some of these problems. And uh, the, the approach we propose is called real-time incentives. Now, it's only a proposal, so it doesn't exist yet. It is not in use anywhere. And um, we have only published it a few months ago as a food for thought paper in the ISIS journal. And we have only presented the approach as sort of a blueprint idea. So none of the details have been filled in yet. But yet we hope that, that this um, new approach to fisheries management can uh, deal with some of the problems I, I outlined. Next, please. Now, under this approach, uh, we would say that each uh, vessel or each fisher gets an annual quota of RTI credits. For example, 150 per year. Now, what are RTI credits? RTIs or RTI credits can be seen as fishing impact equivalents. So each fisher gets, for example, 150 of these fishing impact equivalents. Next slide. Now, what can a fisher do with his 150 uh, RTIs? The fisher is free to fish where and when he wants, given the tariffs. And um, this map that you see here is what we call a tariff map. So if you look carefully, you see there are a few black cells there which are closed to fishing in this example. But, for example, uh, in the red area, fishers would have to pay a uh, tariff of five RTIs per day. So, if you have only 150 for the whole year, then you can't stay in the red areas very long. Alternatively, the fisher can go to the yellow or white areas where um, he pays only a fraction of one RTI per day. Now, 
um, the fisher is allowed to catch and land everything that he catches there. So in this approach, there will be no uh, conventional catch or landings quota. Now, the fisheries managers would, of course, link these tariffs to their management objectives. And uh, in the example I'm going to show you is uh, uh, the objective is to uh, restrict fishing mortality on cod. Next, please. So in this picture, you see uh, scientific data on the spatial distribution of cod based on, on the relative uh, cod LPUE. And in this particular case, you see that the colors of the mats uh, are exactly the same. So uh, what in this uh, illustration the fisheries managers have done is they try to discourage fishing in those areas where cold is very abundant. So fishes are allowed to go to these red areas. They are allowed to target and catch and land all these cold, but they pay five RTIs per day, so they will not be there very long. Alternatively, fishes could go to these areas which are uh, red and yellow, I mean uh, white and yellow, sorry, and uh, target other species which are perhaps very abundant there, and then uh, fish there for a much longer time. So you have these tariff maps linked to a management objective. But the advantage of this approach is that in one single currency of RTI tariffs, and in one single um, tariff map, managers can actually um, put all kinds of other objectives in there as well. So if uh, fisheries managers want to uh, discourage fishing in vulnerable habitats, for example, in habitats where you have cold water corals or bycatches of uh, vulnerable species, they can modify the tariff maps accordingly. Next slide, please. Now, this is just as an illustration of, of what I mean. So, for example, if uh, managers would want to discourage um, fishing where a lot of discards of vulnerable sharks and rays and skates are being made. So, in this map, you see uh, scientific data of, of, of discards of those species, where they are localized. And uh, next, please, managers could then uh, decide to uh, make these areas uh, darker on the tariff map. So there are more black cells now which are close to fishing, and there are also more red cells now where fishers can fish, but they pay five RTIs per day of their total annual amount of, of the 150. Now, um, next please. Um, so, the RTI system does not prescribe and forbid, and it allows fishers to fish whenever and wherever they want. But the advantage of this system is that the costs in terms of overfishing and also the costs uh, to the ecosystem uh, in terms of harming vulnerable species and all that, those costs are internalized. So they become internal to the fishing business. The, the, the individual fisher has to take these costs into account. So in, in this system, the fisher pays those costs, but not in terms of money, there are no fines. The fisher just pays these costs in terms of uh, the, the reducing the fishing opportunities at a faster rate, because he has to pay from his RTI credit at a faster rate when fishing in those areas. So in a very natural way, this aligns uh, the incentive for an individual fisher with the objectives of the fisheries management plan. Each fisher has to make a trade-off, just as we all do in our daily lives. Whenever you choose to do something, you sort of trade off the advantages of an action with the disadvantages of an action, but it is entirely up to you what you choose to do. Next slide, please. Now, I've uh, called this approach the real-time approach, so what about the real-time then? Next, please. Now, because of the new technologies, we can update the tariff maps uh, every week with real-time data. So these would be uh, e-logbook data and VMS data on the, uh, the presence of the, the stock of interest, for example, caught or other things. 
And each week a fisherman would get a new updated tariff map. And there in the black circle you see something white which changes to yellow. So, and here is for example a red block that changes to orange and to lighter orange and back again. So these uh, updated maps reflect the real-time uh, status of, of the resource or of several resources if you want. So that if each week uh, new tariff maps are being issued, um, the tariffs are actually uh, realistically reflecting the status of the resource. Now next please. Yeah, just one more time again, because this is really important. So the advantage of our approach, I think, is that uh, the costs of overfishing and also all other costs to the ecosystem are internalized into the fishing business. So fishers have to just take them into account in their business decisions, whereas in the situation we have now, such costs are borne by the society at large and nobody takes responsibility for it. But here it will just be the case, a fisher can fish and has um, to take into account the harm it does in, in terms of over-exploitation or harm to the ecosystem. So in this case there are no perverse incentives and the um, incentives for the individual fisher are actually aligned with the objectives of the, uh, the, the management plan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your presentation. And we did get it very well. Uh, most of it was a little bit uh, difficulties with the sound for a little while only. So are there any questions to Sarah? Yes, please, present yourself. OK. Uh, my name is Hannah Günther. I've been sent to the uh, European Parliament by the École Nationale d'Administration. And I worked at the GIZ on fisheries. And uh, thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. And my question is about, uh, so what about the communication between fishermen and fishing managers? Because uh, yeah, in order to increase compliance, and uh, so that fishermen consider um, yes, so it to be a, a collective action, so that there is a real incentive. And because otherwise there might be a problem because the system isn't very transparent because fishermen um, haven't been uh, involved in the process. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I agree very much with you that it is very important to, uh, for compliance to actually have the fishermen themselves involved. Now, I'm not sure to what extent you can involve uh, the real, actual individual fishers, but um, I envisage at least that the representatives of fishers in their organizations should be involved to, in a governance process to talk together with uh, scientists and fisheries managers and NGOs and everybody um, when they are trying to decide on, for example, setting these tariffs because in my illustrations it was all very simple, you just link the tariffs to, to the cod or to the vulnerable sharks or something. But of course in reality this has to be done in a decision process which in my opinion should include all uh, stakeholders. But that would be indeed the representatives of the fisher of the industry. And um, I agree with you that ideally uh, fishers themselves should have the feeling that they are also uh, involved because that makes them much more likely to, to comply because they feel then more ownership of the problem. And I don't really know how, how to do that and we would have to talk with everybody on a very much smaller scale and preferentially actually face to face because it has been shown that when people talk face to face, even as we do now through a video, it is very different than when people uh, talk to each other only on paper. Rupert has a question. Um, hi, th thanks for the presentation. It was really enjoyable. Um, my question is, I, maybe I missed this actually, but I was wondering when you mentioned that you'd be internalizing the externalities of the various fishing um, processes, I was wondering uh, how you're going to determine the price of the RTIs. Um, did, did, you, did you mention that? I'm not sure if I missed it. but OK. Um, yeah. So, uh, it, uh, in my personal view, 
RTIs uh, should not be uh, something like ITQs, so they should not be tradable or transferable. And uh, but uh, it's that's just my private opinion, and other people can decide otherwise. But in in my personal view, the RTIs are just allocations that are done by the, the government of a member state or perhaps regional. I, I don't know what that's that's exactly the kind of thing kind of detail that we haven't filled in yet. But in my personal view, these RTIs are just allocations. So as for example, it can be calculated by scientists that a certain amount of fishing effort in, in kilowatt days is needed to catch a certain agreed target of, let's say, caught. Then you can calculate how many RTIs there are available for the fleets. And then you can say, okay, each vessel in that fleet gets a certain portion of it. And how that is calculated is, uh, I, I don't want to fill that in yet. We have to decide that again in a governance process with stakeholders. And by the way, one thing should be clear, and that is that um, vessels with different gear types would get different tariff maps altogether. So the lady who has been talking previously would probably not have to comply with any tariffs at all, I think. But um, if she would, she would get an entirely different tariff map than the ones that fish with trolls. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah, for being with us. And please stay with us now, because now we're going from theory to practice. <laughs>